This week, I'm speaking with Becca Levy, author of Breaking the Age Code, how your beliefs about aging determine how long and well you live. Becca takes a different approach in discussing ageism and what to do about it. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies. Listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers. And finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 265 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller and I'll be your host every Monday for discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. This week, I'm speaking with Becca Levy, author of Breaking the Age Code, How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. Becca takes a different approach in discussing ageism and what to do about it, which is why I have her on the podcast. Let me read from her about section from her website. Dr. Becca Levy, the leading authority on how beliefs about aging influence aging health, is Professor of Epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health and Professor of Psychology at Yale University. Her pathfinding studies have changed the way we think about aging and have received awards from the American Psychological Association, the Gerontological Society of America, hopefully I got that right, and the International Association of Gerontology and Geriatrics. Dr. Levy has given invited testimony before the U.S. Senate on the adverse effects of ageism and has contributed to the U.S. Supreme Court briefs to fight age discrimination. She serves as a scientific advisor to the World Health Organization's campaign to combat ageism. She received her Ph.D. in psychology from Harvard University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Division of Aging and Department of Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. Her expertise on ageism is frequently sought out by outlets such as the New York Times, NPR, and BBC. Ageism is upon us, and I thought Becca approached this topic differently than others that I've had on this podcast. However, before we get to the episode, let's have a word from our sponsor, Career Pivot, The Career Pivot membership community continues to help the members who are participating in this project grow and thrive. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else figure out what they want to do in the second half of life and then make it happen. Let's hear what Cleo had to say about the community. I got a lot of support, the, just the knowledge that you're not alone. Other people are struggling with the exact same thing, and there are ways to deal with it. There are people, you know, there are people, some really interesting success stories that, you know, maybe that's not exactly what I can or want to do, but it's, and you can see the benefits that thing, people will get from different things like that. A couple people that took that positive intelligence course, I could see a real difference in how they acted, felt, and their success after they completed it. And I didn't end up taking the course, but I got the book. I put it as an audio book on my phone. So I would listen to it while I was at the gym. And I mean, it helped me too, just trolling anxiety, getting back to reality, keeping your mind in a good place. And then there are people that I can reach out to. Like if I had something going on, I just felt like I needed to talk to somebody. There were people I could talk that were happy to talk to me. So it's been a positive thing. I'm recruiting new members for the next group. If you're interested in learning more about the endeavor, please go to careerpivot.com slash community. Now on to my discussion with Becky Levy. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I have the real joy of having Becca Levy on the podcast, and she is the author of Breaking the Age Code. How Your Beliefs About Aging Determine How Long and Well You Live. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. Great to join you. 
Well, I found your book quite interesting. What got you to write this book? Yeah, that's a great question. So I decided to write the book in part uh, after um, I had an experience where I went to Japan and I went there with the goal of trying to understand why they have the longest lifespan in the world. And what I immediately noticed is how differently and how much more positively the older people in the culture are treated in Japan than what I was used to seeing where I was living at the time in Boston. And there were just many examples. For, for example, they have a, a holiday where they celebrate older people. They often treat older people like rock stars who are centenarians or super centenarians who are living to 110 and older. So they're treated like these celebrities on, on television. So there's just a lot of examples of a celebration of, of older people. And I became really interested in whether it's possible that the age beliefs that are expressed when they're more positive, whether those can actually have an impact on our health and longevity. And what I found subsequently in in conducting a lot of research is the science supports that. So in fact, these age beliefs that exist in our culture can have a real impact on many different aspects of aging health. Yeah, I found getting into your book, the whole concept of positive age beliefs to be quite interesting, both from our own personal health wise, but also how other people treat us. Because I've had Ashton Applewhite on the podcast, and she talks about ageism as being discriminating against your future self. Exactly. Tell us what you mean by positive age beliefs and negative age beliefs. Yes, that's a good question. So we all have age beliefs. We all have conceptions of aging. And one of the ways that I get at this in my different studies and talking to students is I just ask people, when you think of an old person, what are the first five words or phrases that come to mind? And I tell them, don't think about it too much. Just let whatever image it is come up in your mind and and let me know what it is. And often people haven't really thought about it, that they have these age beliefs, but when they do this exercise, they, most people have this very um, vivid image that immediately comes to mind. And often these images come from stories we hear as, as children. They come from media, social media, from advertisements, from books. And there's a lot of messages that are transmitted with these age beliefs that we encounter that can have a real impact on us. And often without us even knowing it, I mean, they, it often can happen without our awareness and have these profound impacts. What is a positive age belief? So a positive age belief is, so in our, in, in our research, we, um, the way that we've gotten at positive age beliefs is we have asked a whole bunch of different people. When you think of an old person, what are the, what are the phrases or, or words that come to mind? And then we have another group rate those words as either relevant or not relevant to aging and then either positive or negative. So for example, some of the positive words would be things like wisdom or, and fit and creative. Uh, so, the, so we have a set of words and images that are positively associated with aging. Yeah, it's it's interesting because you talked in the book how how positive age beliefs affect your health. How can this how can that be? It should be all about my genes. Uh, right. Yes, yeah, so that's a good question. So, it does seem like I mean, I think that is what we're taught that our aging is very much determined by our biology and our genes, but we know that only 25% of longevity is determined by our genes. So, 75% is due to environmental factors or psychological factors that we can have an influence on. And in my research, what I found is that these age beliefs are something that we really can have an impact on, both by uh, the society that we li- live in or trying to have an impact on society, but also how we take in those age beliefs. So on an individual level, there are these tools that we can uh, take on to shift the age beliefs strengthen the positive ones, and then reduce the many negative ones that are unfortunately out there. Yeah, I'll I'll give you a good example of living where I do in Mexico. About a year ago, I bought a new bicycle, and I got hooked up with a bunch of uh, this Mexican group uh, of mostly, almost half of them were young women. Hmm. And we did a big, huge climb, and when they we 
went up the first big hill, they, they left me, but I'm very good at using the mechanics of the bite. As I crested the last hill, what do I hear? Mark, go, Mark, go, Mark, go. They're cheering me on. Hmm. They were so impressed that I was out there with them because I was the age of the parent. And rather than going, wow, that's weird. Or they were cheering me on. That would have never happened in the U.S. That's a great story. Yeah, I, I, I love that. That's, I think, is a good example of a positive, both positive from, from the other side, from young people. Right, right. That's great. And you, you also, before you were telling me the story of how the plaza near you was celebrating older women, which is also a great story. In 2019, they were rotating pictures through the plaza every few weeks in Ahihi. I am putting up pictures of every woman in the in the community who was over 90 to honor them. Think about you know how that affects uh, how people feel about themselves. Right, that's wonderful. Right? By having a positive age beliefs, how much longer can I expect to live? That's a good question. So after after I went to Japan uh, and I became really interested in the science, whether we could actually take something like these positive age beliefs that exist in the culture, which um, seems so amorphous and actually connect it to something as concrete as our biology and our long, uh, longevity, I came back and searched for a way to study this. And I found this community in Oxford, Ohio, that had been studied a few decades ago by some researchers. And they asked everybody who was 50 and older to describe their age beliefs. And so when I discovered this great sample, I, I connected their age beliefs to survival information that I got from the U.S. government. And I was actually able to see whether their earlier um, assimilated age beliefs impact longevity. And what we found was that those who took in more positive age beliefs at a younger age actually had a survival advantage of about seven and a half years over those who had taken in more negative age beliefs. You also have the chapter ageism, the evil octopus. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about that. Yeah, sure. So I, I was trying to think about a metaphor to describe ageism because I feel like it is omnipresent. It's in so many different aspects of our lives and we often don't see it. So it's this, we have this paradox of it being very much controlling many aspects of, of, of power structures, but then also it's so ingrained uh, that often, unless we develop the skills to notice it, we don't see it. So I thought about an octopus with its many arms, or I guess eight arms <laughs> that stretch in many different ways and, and can operate underwater and actually have have, uh, have a, a, a far reach in many different ways. And so what I uh, was able to do in Breaking the Age Code was to think about different realms that it, it can operate. So for example, uh, social media is something that I'm really interested in because it has such a big impact on, on our lives. And I conducted a study and found that on Facebook, most of the sites that exist that focus on older people, most of the groups tend to have negative portrayals. And not only that, but about 40% of them show um, advocates banning older people from different activities such as swimming and shopping. So, uh, and part of the reason that there is such negativity out there and some of the sites even advocate shooting older people. So there's these terrible messages. And I think one of the reasons that uh, there's there, there, so, uh, and I've actually complained about it multiple times and they say they still exist. And part of the reason I think is because the um, Facebook has community standards that do not exclude, do not protect older people from the hate speech. So that's, uh, even though they do protect other groups. And I think that's just one example of how there's a structure that could be easily improved, but because of this power structure of the social media and Facebook continuing, it, the ageism uh, continues. And instead of becoming a platform to connect the generations, which ideally is what social media should be doing, it uh, is become a platform for spreading some of this ageism. Yeah, I remember talking with Ashton Applewhite, and she talked about the fact that, and by the way, Ashton Applewhite wrote this the book, This Chair Rocks, and I'll put a link to the, the interview in the show notes. But 
she talks about the fact that we naturally age segregate. Yes. You know, all through school, when we, you know, you, you tend to associate with people your own age and as you get older. And so therefore, we all tend to be ageist and we all can be guilty of being of, of exhibiting ageism, both de- both for us older downward and for the younger folks upwards. I found it interesting in the book, you talked about the social media, but you also talked about ageism in, in, in the medical profession. Exactly. Yes. Yes. That's become a real, a real problem that a lot of people complain about. Yeah. So like one, I think one out of five medical encounters by older people, um, older, older patients report experiencing ageism in, in the healthcare encounter, which is, uh, yeah, there are a lot of examples, unfortunately, of ageism in healthcare and in, in, in clinical trials is another area that a lot of clinical trials exclude older people from being part of it. So we don't know how a number of drugs operate um, and how, how they can most benefit us. And part of that is pharmaceutical companies and uh, different trials, not in, just excluding older people. So yes, there are a lot of, a lot of examples of how structural ageism uh, operates today. Quick interruption. If you are enjoying this podcast, please rate it and review it on whatever podcast player you are using. And more importantly, would you mind telling a friend? Thanks. And back to the podcast episode. I had my mother the last five years of her life, and she made five trips to the hospital in the last six months of her life. And I will never forget taking her into the emergency room and they, this doctor x-rayed her and found out she had almost no calcium left in her bones. She was, she had osteoporosis so bad. And he found that funny. Oh no. And I went, wow. Cause I took that as an ageist. I said, uh, there were a number of things in the book that, that hit me in the fact that doctors won't always decide won't, won't particularly in the mental health arena will not address people's mental health problems. Cause they're older. Exactly. Because can you comment on 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 mental health and the old and the and ageism? Sure. Yeah. So unfortunately, a very common misconception that that I discuss in the book is the idea that mental health increases and and becomes more prevalent, uh, and depression is very common in later life. And in fact, the science shows that. Older people, if you look at prevalence of depression and anxiety, they're actually less at risk than than younger people. But in um, because I think in part of the lack of training, so I, I think there are a number of healthcare providers who just haven't had enough training on how to properly care for older people and just um, unfortunately bring these this these stereotypes that they've learned younger in life. They bring that into their healthcare. Um, careers in part because they haven't been exposed to the science that is that shows the many strengths that that increase in older life and the many ways that mental health, for example, um, is treatable in in later life. So I think that that's another stereotype that um, that mental health can't be improved. And we know from a lot of important research that that it can be uh, in many ways in later life. So how do we combat ageism? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so that, that's a good question. And I, I think the ideal is to combat it on two levels. So in the book, I present two blueprints. So one is how to try to combat uh, structural ageism. And the, I try to break it down into the different realms that we can you know, explore to, to overcome it. And then another piece of, of, of the book, I present about 15 evidence-based tools that we can draw on so that we can right away start to improve age beliefs and, and reduce neg- negative age beliefs. And uh, so, so for example, one of the tools that, uh, that I have found that's particularly powerful is to increase our awareness because as I, we talked about, these age beliefs um, can operate without our awareness. So the, so the first step is really to become more aware of it. And one of the things I found that's very powerful 
powerful is something called age belief journaling. And what this is, is uh, I, I suggest that for one week that people write down every portrayal of older people that they see. It could be on television and magazines and social media, you know, over here in a conversation and in, in a coffee shop, whatever it is, when an older person is referred to, write down what the portrayal is and then also mark whether it's a positive or a negative portrayal. And then at the end of the week, look at those different images of aging and see how many are positive and how many are negative. And with the negative ones, think about, is there a different portrayal that I could have seen? Does this match some of the older people that I know who can be quite vibrant in these different ways? And I found that that exercise of making age beliefs more visible, more aware, can actually have very quick improvements in, in our age beliefs. So- how can you affect the age beliefs of others? I mean, I'll use the example. I've got several um, folks I've social media posts on, you know, how do I get a younger hiring manager to talk to me or to even care about me? <laughs> yeah. So that's a good question. So, you know, I think um, one, one way is to speak out and to counter some of the negative age beliefs when they come up in a conversation or, or um, and I think, um, and actually, also in the book, I presented I present uh, a, a blueprint of how to counter some of the negative age beliefs. So it's, so it's almost I call it ammunition to counter negative age beliefs. And, and I present some of the most common age beliefs, and then the science that discounts it or shows that there actually are strengths often that aren't recognized. And so I think the ideal is to actually like to pull on this information when it comes up and say, hey, that that really does isn't supported by the science. Um, but I, I also would add that in my own case, I find that when I hear kind of ages comments or negative age beliefs, I don't always have a response right away. I'm the kind of person that hears something and then thinks about it and thinks about whether it makes sense. But I think it's always fine to go back to a conversation. So even if you don't immediately respond, I think it's fine to say like, hey, I heard you say this at this meeting last week and I've been thinking about it. And actually, I don't know if you know, but there's this science out there which actually shows what you presented doesn't match what we know about aging. So I think there's always an opportunity to come back and, and let people know what the science is. Like you talked about the Japanese society, which very much is honors the aged and the, the older you, you get more respect and we are experiencing a blossoming of ageism coming out of the pandemic and I believe a lot of it is due to we've we've been even more isolated now this last two years than we've been in a long time. And it's easy for people who haven't been exposed to peers who are older in a long time. I, I have a chapter in my book on what I call MSU disorder, which is make stuff up that we start making up stories about the older population. And again, going back to Ash and Applewhite's discussion, the, the best place to start with, our, with ageism is with ourselves and our own behaviors. You talk about the ABC method to bolster positive age beliefs. What does ABC stand for? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. So I was trying to boil it, the method down from the science to a easy us. Uh, set of steps. And so A stands for awareness. So to increase our awareness of our own age beliefs, and then also become better at recognizing the age beliefs that are out there in society. So the different portrayals of ageism or, or age beliefs, both the positive and the negative, I think we can recognize or become more aware of. And I think that, that both are important pieces of the process. The second, the B stands for blame or place blame where blame is due. And that's the idea that because aging, if we don't become aware of these age beliefs, it's easy to blame challenges in aging on aging itself, or even blame the older person for some of the challenges that they face, whether it be fi being fired from a job or whether it be some kind of health, health impact of, of the age beliefs. But if we don't, if we don't, if we, if we blame the per older person or aging, then we are not recognizing that the source could be something that we have control over, which are these age beliefs. And so 
the process, the second step is to try to attribute or see what the cause of these challenges are and blame ageism as opposed to aging. And then the, the third is um, challenge. So, so you raised that earlier. So that's a great question of how do you actually make a change in how um, the age beliefs that are out there and particularly the, the ageism, how do we actually encounter it and reverse it? And so that the third step is to find ways to challenge ageism by bringing up the science or the facts or telling somebody, I don't know if you realize what you just said, but that is doesn't match how most older people exist in, in, in the world. So, you know, I think, I think finding ways to, and, and then actually challenging ageism in the structural ways that we see it as well. So if we see that a certain company is um, not hiring any older people or is, you know, firing all the older people, then find ways to challenge that. I, I remember at my last corporate gig, which was a tech startup, and I wanted to hire someone in their mid fifties, and I was in my mid fifties. And my hiring manager, the my my boss said, "I just don't think he has the energy," which is code for he's too old. Mm -hmm. I did not pick that up as an ageist remark. It wasn't until actually I had a recruiter at my job club use that exact same term going, he just called me too old. Be able to recognize that ageist language. Exactly. That's really important. And if I had recognized it, I could have countered it. And that's one of the biggest challenges is getting used to, I guess, the code words, the how things, because you brought up a number of things in the book that were very, uh, some very subtle ways uh, that, you know, we get in advertising, as you say, we get in social media, we get these age beliefs, you're not going to suddenly counter them overnight. You kind of have to chip away at them. Right, right, exactly. I think, I think that it's a, it's a, a important process, as you said, to recognize these subtle forms. And actually in uh, in social media, one of the ways that ageism operates is the exclusion of older people from seeing different job ads and housing ads. And so that's, that's a kind of example of ageism by omission, which we know can also occur. So that's challenging to notice unless you've got the information about how digital discrimination is operating, you know, on a, on a broader level. And we, I think we have to kind of work together to, to investigate that and, and find examples. Yeah. There's, there were a number of things during the pandemic about job ads mm -hmm. where they, where they specifically started only showing the ads to a certain demographic. Exactly. And if you understand about Facebook lookalike groups and things like that, it's boy, it's pretty targeted and it could be pretty discriminatory. It's true. But I, I think there's also hope. I think there is the beginning of a age liberation movement. There's we're seeing signs that people are coming together and just are not going to take it anymore. These examples of, of ageism. And I, I was actually I'm delighted to be part of the first uh, anti-ageism rally that took place a few years ago outside of Central Park. And it brought together people of all different generations who uh, talked about examples of ageism that they've experienced, but also the desire to increase the opportunities and, and, and human rights of, of older people. And it was great because it was being led by older people, but there were also a lot of younger allies who were there who were really excited to, you know, to support what was going on. So I, I think, I think hopefully we're going to get to a, a tipping point where we, that, that, that builds momentum and, and changes, reduces ageism. So when someone finishes reading your book, what would you like them to do? I would like somebody to become aware of the impact of these age beliefs and the science that supports how they can have really detrimental impacts when we have ageism. But also, I would like them to have the knowledge and the tools to strengthen the positive age beliefs. So we know from our science that they're very malleable. So even though we take them in as young as age three, we also have found, you know, in my research, I've found that there's lots of examples of us being able to reduce the negative age beliefs and strengthen the positive age beliefs. So 
I would like somebody who has um, who has the book to come away with all of those messages and tools that really empowers them to improve the their age beliefs on a you know individual, but also on a societal level, and then to have health benefits. Yeah, I I, I think starting working on your own age beliefs, understanding what your own age beliefs are. Yes. I know living where I do, where I go hiking with a bunch of folks, by the way, a lot of women in their seventies who kick my butt going up the mountain and you suddenly start going, Oh, they're how old, (laughs) you know, they're basically positive role models. Yeah, that's a great example. And I I think, right. So I think engaging in different activities, I mean, unfortunately, the United States has become one of the most age segregated countries in the, in the world, but I think finding opportunities to interact with, um, with people of all different ages can provide a lot of examples of, you know, wonderful, wonderful older people that, and that was, that was actually something I really enjoyed in writing the book was I had the opportunity to meet and to interact with these wonderful examples of, of older people doing these really creative, um, interesting, interesting things. And actually, you know, I, I, I love that you take the idea of pivoting careers or, or pivoting in later life. Cause I think that that's really inspiring. There are a number of people I spoke to who had these great pivots in, in later life that really um, brought about these great benefits to them in part by drawing, I think on these positive age beliefs. Yeah. The other one is the other advantage of, I, I, I call networking down networking with people who are younger than you getting involved with people who are younger than you, you get rid of the, negative age beliefs you have of younger people. Yes. Right. The, Oh, they're all in feel entitled. They all are, they, they're, they're all technology based. And I, I often joke cause I I've been spent almost my entire career in high tech, in fact, very leading edge tech. And I'm standing here holding up my iPhone. It was my generation that built this. Yes. <laughs> my son, who's 37, can whip my butt using it, but he doesn't understand how this thing works. And I, you know, I've worked on the hardware, software, the whole piece. And so it's the younger folks are better at using the technology, but that doesn't mean they're te- that doesn't mean they're tech savvy. Exactly. Yes. There are many examples of yeah, older people being very tech savvy and uh and actually, in one of my favorite examples in the book was there it was an MIT professor who was in her mid 70s to develop this incredible nanotechnology that really changed the field. So, yes, I think there I think you're right. There are just really a lot of great examples of people busting that myth of being um, of or showing all the ways that that older people can be technologically savvy. This has been great. If someone wanted to reach out and contact you, Becca, and obviously buy your book. How might they do that? Yes. Well, so they can contact me. Um, so I have, I have a website at, at, at Yale on, under my faculty page, but I also I have just developed a book web page that is Becca dash levy.com, which will connect you to information about the book and indie booksellers. So that, so I was excited to be able to include different places that you can buy the book. So it's, it's available on Amazon, but also uh, if you go to the website, there's ways to connect to booksellers who would, yeah, who are, we, we'd love to support as well. So yes, thank you for asking. <laughs> and we will put all those links in the show notes. So Becca, Thank you very much for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. It was great to talk to you. Thank you so much for including me. I found the connection of our own age beliefs and our health to be quite intriguing. That is something we can take action on, but the battle against ageism will take time. Will it go away in my lifetime? You got me. Take a moment, go to careerpivot.com, sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You'll get a weekly update on the podcast, white papers, and blog posts. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. 
Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode dash 265. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. In fact, this podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. I hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career Podcast.